welcome everyone. Uh, I know that five o'clock sort of people are starting to get hungry, but we really, really are excited to talk for a few minutes uh, about this program, the uh, Medical Scholars Research Program at NIH. Uh, I want to thank Dr. Hongwei Gao, who is a program officer at the for the Clinical and Translational Research Centers. That's sort of the NIH program that the uh, CTSI, Clinical and Translational Science Institute at West Virginia, is based on. Uh, and we are, are really, I am personally delighted to have two folks that are going to talk to you about the Scholars Program. Uh, first, Dr. Tom Burklow is the Deputy Director of the Office of Clinical Research Training and Medical, Medical Education uh, at NIH, and he uh, directs the Scholars Program. Uh, he is a pediatric cardiologist by trade. He still sees uh, children at the clinical center uh, at NIH. And prior to joining NIH, uh, he served 30 years in the Army, where uh, he was chief of pediatrics and then director of healthcare operations at Walter Reed. And he has a number of honors. Uh, and he has been a real proponent, not only obviously of the Research Scholars Program, but of involvement of West Virginia specifically and other states that often really do not sometimes have a high profile at NIH. So we are delighted that, that he has uh, found time and can join. I also want to welcome a dear friend of mine, Sundas Latif, who started working with me back when she was an undergraduate, seems like yesterday, but it was uh, more than a couple years. And she was the first medical research scholar to come from West Virginia University. So what we have planned this afternoon is Dr. Uh, Burklow is gonna start and he's gonna talk about some of the specifics of the program. And then Sundas, uh, who I think had a fabulous year there is going to give you some of her thoughts about the opportunities uh, there and how that relates to your career. And then we will open it up for your questions. And I would ask uh, if I say anything wrong here, Ian, uh, let me know. But if you could put your questions in the chat box and we will try to get all of them. Is that right, Ian? That's correct. Yeah, I've got the, I've got the chat box up and we'll, we'll kind of get to them as they come in right at the end. OK, OK, fantastic. So we'll start with Dr. Burklow. Uh, well, good afternoon, good evening, and uh, thank you for taking a little bit of time out of your dinner time to uh, to talk. And uh, as Dr. Hodder uh, mentioned, you know, I really am very excited uh, to be able to talk with you. Last year, was it last year? I forgot, I'm losing track of the years. <laughs> I think it was last year. <laughs> That's my COVID dementia. You know, I actually had a chance to come uh, out to Morgantown uh, to visit the medical school and to you know hear about your programs, you know, and then you know especially what's happening with the Clinical and Translational Sciences Institute, you know, and I and the West Virginia clearly has a focus on you know developing science that's applicable to the patients that we care for, and you know to develop a generation of clinician scientists, and with that I think the MRSP program kind of fits in well with that uh, that goal and that mission. Um, I just took over the program uh, about two and a half years ago, um, and I guess three years ago now. Yeah, I don't know. It, well, but not too long ago. Uh, and one of the things that we talk about diversity, and, you know, and obviously we talk about racial and gender diversity. But one of the things that I, I think I feel very strongly about, and I think because I come from a, a somewhat rural background, is that a geographic diversity too. And so having places like West Virginia and states like West Virginia and South Carolina, which are um, I, I don't think it's too far to say it's habitually underrepresented in, uh, in the field. I think it's important that we reach out because I strongly believe that uh, investigators understand the problems better when they come from those populations, regardless of how you want to kind of slice and dice that. So, um, you know, I think that uh, West Virginia is, is a very robust school. I think that, uh, you know, people who have the right aspiration preparation can do well in programs like the MRSP program. There are others out there, uh, but we'll just talk about that. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the MRSP, um, about that. If, uh, Ian, if you can go to the next slide, please. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me just talk about this slide first because I'm required to talk about this slide. So one thing about the MRSP program is that it's, it's actually a jointly sponsored program. Uh, the funding for the program actually comes from two different uh, pots. The scientific director for the Institutes for National Institutes of Health uh, 
provide a majority of the funding, but we also get private uh, donor funding from places like the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation, American Association of General Research, Colgate Palmolive, um, and they work through the Foundation for the NIH. So you can see this really is a public-private uh, public partnership that we're very proud of. Next slide, please. So again, if you'll just flip through this. So I'm gonna provide a little overview of the, uh, the program itself. Then I'm gonna step back and turn over to uh, Sundas, who's a superstar, and she'll really convince you about the program. Um, and then uh, we'll talk very briefly at the end about the MRSP application, about how, what we look for, uh, and then we'll provide you some points of contact at the end. Uh, like I said, it's a little awkward going through all this uh, from a virtual platform, but you know, uh, Ian will help manage the chat box and we'll make sure all your questions are answered. You'll have my email, Dr. Hodder's email and uh, Sunday's email. If you have other questions, I want folks to feel free to contact us. Um, the, the NIH, if you've not been here, uh, so many of you probably have through other different programs like the summer internship program. This is a phenomenal place where you have people who are Fundamentally curious about the the, the under uh, the, the tenets of disease, and so we talk about this mission statement to understand you know abnormal physiology, normal physiology to actually make life better for everybody. And this, the NIH really is a national uh, resource, and so I think many investigators um, you know spend time at some point in their career at the NIH. And if nothing else, I think you, you develop uh, affiliations and relationships in, uh, uh, with investigators at the NIH and you will receive NIH sponsored uh, grants. And so it's, it's hard to become an investigator and not have some affiliation with the NIH itself. Next slide, please. So the program. So it's important that Stand, if you go back, there you go. So it's not a research program. Uh, you can do research anywhere. But what I liked, and this was my epiphany, I guess I was in this position for like two months. It's not a research program, it's a career development program for students like yourselves who are, want to seek careers in biomedical research that's centered around a robust uh, investigational experience. Again, underlying career development program. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about what, what that means, uh, at least from the Tom Burkle view of the world. Next slide. The program itself is structured this way. It's a, a year-long program. It's a comprehensive program, meaning we, we, we cover many different areas within the curriculum and as well as the research. And it is for not just medical students, but also dental students and veterinary students as well. You select your research. We don't assign your research. The most important uh, word in that second bullet there is the word mentored. You, you'll participate in a mentored basic translational clinical research pro, uh, project that's in a field of your interest and what matches your career and research goals. Uh, the NIH actually has uh, two different uh, uh, divisions. There's the extramural division. And so when folks have uh, NIH grants, 80% uh, of the funding that comes to NIH actually goes to these extramural programs that will go to executives like Dr. Hodder at West Virginia and, and other uh, academic institutions. The intramural program is what happens in Bethesda. And that's about 20% of the overall NIH uh, budget. And so the program here uh, is centered in, uh, in the campus at the, uh, in Bethesda, Maryland. As I mentioned before, it's co-sponsored by the scientific directors at NIH, as well as the private partners uh, through the FNIH. Next slide, please. This is, the quick, this is how the program is kind of set up. Um, and I see, you know, you see here, it's a, a mentoring, advising, and, and curriculum surrounded by this robust investigational experience. Your year is focused on that big dark blue box, your core investigational experience. 80% of your time is actually spent uh, working uh, in the laboratory, either wet lab, dry lab, computational biology, it can take different forms, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. Working very closely with your mentor. The mentor uh, selection is the most important decision you will make before you uh, come here. And we, uh, and we help with that. And I'll tell you what, how that will work. Uh, Dr. Uh, Mehta, Nehal Mehta, who uh, was uh, Sundas' um, uh, mentor is superb. And she'll be talking about, uh, to you about that relationship. The advisor is someone else who actually this is an individual, he or she will, it serves like an active advisor, may, may or may not be in your discipline, 
but do over the course of the year, someone you'll be meeting periodically to talk about, the, the, you know, basically what does it mean to develop a career as a clinician scientist? Um, talk about the challenges, you know, uh, 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 within a, a particular field. And this is a person you can actually work with. Sometimes you need someone apart from your mentor to talk about how the year is going. And so this advisor serves that role. Surrounding all of this then, is, and this is what makes the year unique. We have a, a series of seminars. One is called Process of Discovery. Um, and this is where we have uh, senior investigators and directors at the NIH come talk specifically to the MSP scholars about not just research, but about their path to research. Um, and in other words, how did that individual get to be standing in front of a, 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 a room at a podium talking before that group? You know, and so uh, it, it is interesting uh, to hear their stories because you'll find that career, you know, you would like to think your career is going to take a, a linear path from point A to point B to point C. Uh, but oftentimes issues like uh, things like serendipity, life and other things factor in, it may actually change your uh, career path. You know, I'm, I'm sure Dr. Hodder can probably attest to that. Things you find yourself pursuing weren't things you necessarily perceived uh, or conceived of five years beforehand. And so when you hear senior investigators talk about that, I think it's reassuring that there's no right way to develop a career. And so that's what we, that, uh, that's what that seminar series is all about. Clinical teaching rounds. Every patient that comes to NIH is on some research protocol. Uh, we don't have primary care clinic. We don't even have an emergency room, which is uh, interesting when, when patients need to be, need emergency room. Um, so every patient who, who comes here is on a research protocol. So we have clinical teaching rounds. But what's different about uh, teaching clinical teaching rounds here, say then at West Virginia, is that it's used, these patients have rare or refractory diseases. They may come to NIH because they've exhausted all other therapeutic modalities within, uh, you know, from where they come. And they, uh, and so not only do we talk about the science and we talk about their research, we talk about their disease, the patients themselves, themselves are present and, and, and the scholars have an opportunity to talk to, the, uh, to these uh, patients and ask questions about, what does it mean to have disease X? And what does it mean when you, you know, and, and scholars ask very insightful questions and sometimes very difficult questions. And so it's a, it's a very, this is like one of the more popular uh, seminars that we do, which are the clinical teaching rounds. We have a journal club. The journal club is not simply a matter of pulling, you know, looking at recent articles, but in fact, Dr. Susan Lightman, who's our academic director, has a uh, curriculum uh, uh, laid out so that we take the scholars through uh, a series of problems within the medical literature, starting with things like, you know, uh, phase one, phase two trials, bioethics, it could be about meta-analysis. And so each journal club session has a theme that the scholars present on that theme and then present an article reflecting that theme. Uh, so it, it, at the end of the year, you really understand what, how to read uh, uh, the literature. We also have workshops. Uh, we have workshops on how to improve your CV, because one thing is then that we've made you a great uh, researcher. We want to be make sure you're marketable as a researcher, too. Right. Uh, and so you have to sell your skills. So we want to make sure that you, you, we give you a workshop on CV writing, interview skills that I was sharing with Sundas. Uh, and, and, you know, now we add in a module and she heard this, too. We had a module about how to do virtual interviews, too. We also talk about work-life balance. We have a panel discussion with uh, mid-career investigators to meet with the scholars, talk about, you know, great, you, you want to be a great uh, researcher. You also want to see patients. You, all, you may want to have a life partner. You may want to have kids. You may want to travel. How do you balance all these things out? And, and these become important. And then finally, there's a whole ongoing uh, series of seminars that occurs at the NIH. Some are associated with MRSP, but some are just in the general community of the NIH that you get to partake in. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a, a, the, what uh, we did with, uh, uh, with Sundas's year group. And you see Dr. Francis Collins came to meet with uh, the scholars. Um, uh, Dr. Doug Lowy, uh, who's the acting director of National Cancer Institute. Uh, previous year, we had Dr. Fouch, who comes to speak to MSP scholars. Um, down here is uh, Nehal Mehta, who, uh, who again, once again, is Sundas's mentor, who came to talk about uh, not again, not just about their research, but about their career path in research. And I think these are always very, these are a lot of fun discussions. Next slide, please. 
So why MRSP? Well, first of all, it, it, once again, I'll, and I'll just reiterate, is the issue of mentorship within and across the disciplines. The advising program becomes very important because that's separate and distinct from your research and having someone you can uh, turn to to discuss that becomes important. All your time is uh, devoted to research if you're not within a curriculum. And the curriculum itself, as I point out, is a very unique curriculum. Uh, team science. And the fact you get to collaborate with peers, you understand how this works. It's, 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 it's almost like a magical experience in watching this thing grow. And you develop uh, a network. And, and the, the, uh, you develop um, working with your mentor. This will likely be a lifelong relationship you have. And then even likely with your peer MRSP scholars. You, know, you may find yourself reaching across and picking up the phone uh, and calling a past scholar saying, I, I see that you're working in the same field. It, that's how networking occurs, and that's how people develop ideas together. Next slide. And lastly, oops, well, lastly, was that immersive residential experience. You live on campus, uh, and so in a, an apartment building, uh, which some of us may be talking a little bit. And so not only do you work at the NIH, but you live together with uh, like-minded uh, scholars from across the country. Next slide. Uh, a lot of opportunities. The, 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 the opportunities with the laboratory are uh, tremendously varied. You know, our scholars participate in flow cytometry, CRISPR, advanced imaging modalities. Um, there is an entity on campus called the Foundation for Advanced Education and Sciences. They conduct graduate level courses that you can take. Many people take classes in uh, statistical programming, for example. Not everybody comes to the NIH, to the MRSP program with a robust background in uh, programming. This is your opportunity for not only hands-on uh, experience, but also formal didactic uh, training in uh, programming, for example. So in public speaking, uh, publications, uh, and virtual national meetings, and now in this time of COVID. So next slide. These are um, an example of what the scholars investigate. So next, one click, one click. So uh, they'll study very basic uh, questions. This is, these are examples of some of the basic research that's done by MRSP scholars. Next click. Then we have translational uh, research that's conducted by some scholars. Next click. There's others that are doing more uh, 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 clinical type of research. Next click. And one thing that I think that is, is I think underrecognized is the, is the amount of popula he population health and health uh, disparities research that's done at NIH 12. So these are all examples of what our current, uh, our, our scholars participate in terms of research. So next slide. Finding a mentor is the most important process. Um, and so even though there's 1500 investigators at the NIH, only 300, about 300 are actually quote unquote approved for the uh, MRSP program because we want scholars to be paired with um, individuals who are experienced and mentoring young investigators. Uh, it's one thing to mentor a postdoc. It's another, uh, it uh, takes someone else with a different sort of mindset uh, to be able to mentor someone earlier in their career. So we want to make sure that people are uh, paired with strong mentors. And so Dr. Lightman, working with your advisor, working with you and your interests, will help provide you resources and guidance on how to find, uh, find that mentor. We have online resources, but sometimes the most important information you get is actually by word of mouth. So uh, in all accepted scholars, uh, we have a workshop in, or uh, yeah, workshop in April uh, that will set you on the path about how to find a mentor. And we constantly are there to offer guidance and direction uh, to get people uh, into the right laboratory. Uh, and you know, we this year we had work a little bit differently because because of social distancing. Um, I don't know how it's going to work for next year yet. We, we it's yet to be decided, but we did kind of uh, ask scholars to identify their mentors earlier than they have in, in years past. Otherwise, you know, people do have some uh, luxury of time, like a week or two, once they get to NIH to identify their uh, final mentor because we want to make sure this is a lasting partnership. Next slide. These are the benefits. We do pay you, um, and we actually give you relocation expenses uh, to and from Bethesda. And of course, being the government, we pay you and we take some of it back. So even though we provide housing, or it's more like we provide access to housing, and so uh, we do have to charge a rent. And so the rents are actually below uh, market rates, uh, although they're still somewhat comparable. 
Uh, Bethesda, as you probably can guess, is a rather expensive area, uh, but uh, people can cover the uh, uh, rent well with, uh, with their stipend. The education fund, this is an education stipend that we also provide to covers for domestic travel when people are actually traveling, but also meeting registrations and the tuition support uh, for scientific courses and textbooks uh, for the, uh, you know, for the FAES programs I talked about earlier. And finally, and I think importantly, uh, we provide health insurance and this is covered by the program itself. Next slide. This is a picture of uh, Sundance's fine group. Uh, we actually haven't been able to gather for a group picture like this. So uh, we'll, we may have to do a Zoom picture of, uh, of the class of 2021. But uh, anyway, but this is what uh, the, the fine young people in our program look like. Next slide. Uh, this is where our scholars come from. Notably absent this year, you can see there's a big gray box where the state of West Virginia uh, is. So I want to make sure that gets filled next year. But these are... Uh, and by the color density, you can see where uh, where the scholars come from. Uh, on the left, you see that that actually that title is uh, yeah. So um, you know this year's class, we have about 61% females and 25% are coming from underrepresented minority populations. So next slide. And with that, I'm going to turn over to Sundas. Thank you, Dr. Burklow. Sort of the way I began the MRSP journey was in the fall of my second year. And I remember distinctly coming out of pathology lecture and Dr. Hodder had sent me a message saying I really needed to consider this program. And my feelings towards the program evolved as I went through the application experience, journeying to the NIH for the interview process and meeting people who had gone through the year themselves. And as Dr. Brooklow said, one of the fundamental parts of being a medical research program, medical research scholar program participant is that you get you get to network with people who are ph phenomenal mentors. And uh, Nehal Mehta was my mentor. I contacted him prior to beginning the program. And then when I arrived at the NIH, spent a few days in his lab and then realized that he was the right fit for me and the people in the lab were going to be a really good fit as well. Dr. Mehta works in the section of inflammation and cardiometabolic diseases at the National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute. And on the next slide, you'll see the members of the lab. The members of the lab are incredibly diverse from advanced scientists in the field to clinical providers such as physicians and physician assistants, medical students, and students who have just completed their undergraduate education. The people you see pictured here represent only about half of the lab. It was a very vibrant group and it really made for a great experience for me because I got to learn from PhDs and MDs, but then I also got to mentor students who had just completed their undergrad and help them with their own projects and writing and public speaking, which was very fulfilling for me and something that I was looking forward to in a research year, the ability to be a part of multiple different projects. And next slide, please. And the fundamental philosophy of the Meta Lab is to investigate heart attack because it remains the leading cause of death worldwide. And heart attack is predominantly caused by atherosclerosis, which is accelerated by inflammation. The figure you see on the bottom is one of the tenants of the Meta Lab and represented broadly in our research. On the left side of the figure, you see what is early endothelial dysfunction in major vasculature in the body. And over time, and with various inflammatory insults, as well as lipid accumulation, you see progression of atherosclerosis to the right side of the image, which represents plaque rupture or overt cardiovascular disease. And in order to better get at the question of inflammatory driven atherosclerosis, Dr. Mehta has done a great job of assembling a cohort of people who have psoriasis. Next slide, please. So the Meta Lab is built on studying psoriasis as a model of inflammatory atherogenesis. And one of the attractive parts of the lab for me was the clinical translational blend in the lab. The clinical arm involved physicians and physicians assistants who would meet with our patients who had psoriasis who were referred to us from dermatologists around the country. And the imaging arm focused on studying the biomarkers as well as radiologic markers of disease, as well as early cardiac disease in these people who have psoriasis at multiple time intervals. And then the translational research arm represented studying the microbiology of inflammatory coronary artery disease. 
And I was very fortunate to be able to work in all three arms, which gave me both clinical exposure to seeing these patients and working with providers, the imaging arm, which allowed me to interface with cardiologists and radiologists, both as a mentoring aspect and learning the science behind these imaging techniques. And then the translational research arm, which allowed me to interface with scientists, including scientists at Walter Reed National Military Medical Center. And through these experiences, I got to meet people who were very passionate about their work and very happy to teach me and show me how these experiments can be carried out at the bench and the computer and at an epidemiological level. As I mentioned before, our lab studies a cohort of people who have psoriasis and the relationship with psoriasis and cardiometabolic disease, including metabolic syndrome, diabetes mellitus, and obesity. If you could do one click, please. Thank you. So my meta lab projects were diverse and included both microbiology and microRNA experiments, whole genome sequencing, and studying early blood biomarkers of cardiac disease. As I mentioned before, there was also a component of the lab dedicated to imaging, such as coronary computed tomography and geography. And if you could do one click, please, Ian. This image is a classic image that we study in the Meta Lab. It represents the right coronary artery reconstructed from coronary computed tomography and geography imaging. And this kind of imaging and studying what is novel has been, was a really, really great experience as part of the Meta Lab. My favorite project was probably bullet three, chronic stress and cardiovascular disease in which we related life stressors along with inflammatory markers and psoriasis to cardiovascular disease over time. Next slide, please. And so in addition to having both a phenomenal scientific exper experience and being able to network with Dr. Mehta and travel across the country to present at national meetings, in addition to presenting at local meetings at the NIH, I think probably one of the best parts of the program was the people that I met. On the left side of the, on the, left side of the slide, you see an image of a few of the people in my cohort. It was our first weekend together and we went to the National Arboretum just outside of DC. It was incredibly hot, but we had a really good time exploring uh, the Arboretum and all of these places that DC had to offer. On the right side of the slide, you see me as Bob Ross and my good friend, Alyssa Lee from the University of Pennsylvania School of Dentistry as a happy little cloud. This was the MRSP Halloween party held at one of the houses that the uh, program provides for students who are part of the program as well. Next slide, please. Alyssa and I again visiting the DC Zoo. And then on the right, you see Lynn Dabul. She is applying to neurology programs and she is a current student at Cleveland Clinic School of Medicine. We went to an event at Freedom Square in DC. Next slide, please. And in that image on the left, you see Mary Sviridova. She was one of the students who had completed undergrad and then joined the lab. And we collaborated on a lot of projects together and she taught me about microbiology. I helped her with her writing and presentations. And here you see our most important collaboration, which is a delicious chicken piccata order, uh, which was a really fun meta lab dinner. The image on the right is an image I took from my uh, balcony at my apartment at the cloister. Where most of the students stay as part of the program, it's called the Cloisters by most of the students. And it used to be a convent for the Sisters of the Order of the Visitation. And it was sold to the NIH and then converted to a housing for visiting scholars and then eventually MRSP participants. And just beyond the trees, it's a little hard to tell, you can see the clinical center. So my walk in the morning from my apartment to the clinical center, which was the hospital where my lab was situated, was shorter than my walk within the hospital to get to my lab. It was really nice to be situated so close to the hospital and also it was very peaceful to be living on the NIH campus because in the evenings and on weekends, among this hustle and bustle of living in Bethesda, the campus was very quiet. It felt like something out of a Jane Austen novel. There were so many places on the cloister grounds to sit and read or do work. And it was definitely a very picturesque and magical place to be. Next slide, please. And so I just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge both the Meta Lab for their phenomenal mentorship, both in, in the program and helping me understand my career goals, 
and the MRSP administration for creating what amounts to a life-changing experience for so many people who go through the program. I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Burklow and as Dr. Burklow mentioned, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat or feel free to email me. Thank you. Thank you, Sundas. I, I have to confess, I, I saw that photograph earlier of, Bob, who's Bob Ross? I go, oh my God, it's Sundas. <laughs> and <laughs> Alyssa was the one who made the portrait. She has amazing artistry skills and she put the wig on that. me. <laughs> well, well done. Um, so let's talk very briefly about the application process. We'll give you the URL for the, uh, for the Medical Research Scholars Program. It'll take you to this page. Next click. And you'll see on the right-hand box, these where are where you'll find more detailed information about the program itself, uh, and including next. Uh, there, there's I don't see it there. Oh yeah, there is a link. So when you click on that link, it will take you to the online uh, application process. There's nothing has to be mailed. Everything will get submitted uh, via the uh, uh, online application. Next slide, please. What makes for a competitive uh, applicant? First of all, I, I want to dissuade anybody of a notion you have to have a long CV uh, to become competitive. Uh, to is the only way to be uh, be competitive for the uh, MRSP program. Obviously, you know if, if you've had a, a, a robust CV, that will obviously make you competitive. But we recognize not everybody has had research opportunities because of where they lived, either high school, college, or whatever. Um, but what we're looking for are people who, even in the absence of that, clearly demonstrated uh, either a, kind of a, an epiphany and a, and a passion, or took advantage of the opportunities that were available. You know, and so if you are, if you if you really envision yourself as a clinician scientist in that fifteen or twenty year mark, then this is a program you should give serious consideration to. Uh, again, that clear interest in research that's gonna be reflected in your personal statement and your letter of recommendation become the most important uh, aspect of your program, uh, of your application. Strong and detailed letter of uh, recommendation from faculty who know you well. Um, and that, you know, uh, if, if you've had any research uh, experience or exposures, those letters become very powerful. Uh, if it means uh, work with a, you know, a clinical staff, who knows you well, those become obviously very, uh, very important as well. We don't wanna see letters that simply just say, you know, that you're a student in good standing. Those unfortunately don't uh, hold much water, but we really wanna have a, we really do, everything gets read uh, in, in detail, all your letters by the, the, the admissions committee, by myself, by Dr. Lightman. Uh, so everything that gets submitted is read. Uh, as I say here, if your research confidence are modest, then have your recommenders, uh, you know, address this both positively as well as strongly. Uh, that focused cover letter, a personal statement is going to be uh, critical. We want to see your writing skills so that you know, not only what you say, but how you say it becomes important. And this applies to everything you do, not just MRSP, but any type of uh, program you're applying to and, and grammar matters. So um, use this as an opportunity to describe your motivations to pursue biomedical research in a career path. And then if I may, okay, this is a little inside track information for everybody who's uh, listening in. I think it becomes important too, it becomes, at least as Tom Burklow, if I'm reading your application, if I see a statement in there that, you, that illustrates you understand a program and you talk about what the program is offering and why you're gonna benefit from that program, more than simply say, MRSP is offering me a, a chance to do research. And instead we talk about the curriculum or we talk about this or we talk about this exposure uh, and how that is something you want or need or seeking as you uh, you know advance your own career. Uh, don't wait till last minute to apply. Uh, every last every year, uh, we there are a couple applicants, applications uh, we cannot accept because uh, uh, your materials are in late. We do give a little um, latitude to the uh, letter of recommendation, but your core materials need to be in well before uh, the deadline I recommend. Uh, again, every year there's a, a couple that don't make the, the cutoff. So I strongly recommend you uh, do apply early. Next slide, please. These, uh, you'll get this information. These are the various links, again, specifically for the Medical Research uh, Scholars Program. Um, the office itself, the clinical center to understand a little bit more about the environment. 
This email here is for the, if you have any administrative questions about the applications or such, that, that's the, uh, the box for the MRSP uh, administrative team. Next slide. Uh, next slide again. That's our Twitter and Instagram if you want to go to that. Next. And next click. We'll go to questions and one more slide. This is our contact information again. Um, feel free to uh, reach out to me uh, and uh, Dr. Susan Lightman. She's the academic director. We're happy to talk to you about the experience, about the research and the academics, as well as the curriculum itself. So, and then Sundas is always there in your, in your uh, backyard to answer questions about her own experience. So with that, we have a bit of time here to take any questions. I think uh, Ian, you're, you want the uh, uh, folks to add in questions in the chat and you'll read them, is that right? Yeah, uh, if, there, if there are any uh, questions, feel free to type them in the chat and we'll just, we'll go through them as they, as they come in. I don't see any there now, but I, I wondered, first of all, I wanna thank Dr. Burklow and thanks Sundas. Uh, you know, every time I hear about this program, I get excited and wish I were a medical student. <laughs> Uh, because it, it really is fabulous, and thank you. While folks are uh, typing in their, their questions in the chat, you know, given uh, the current time, and, and Dr. Burklow, you may or may not be able to answer this, but, but what is the thinking about having students uh, on campus? Um, do you anticipate that there's going to be a significant sort of difference, or do you anticipate that by you know the second half of the year, uh, most students will be able to uh, procure the vaccine. Yeah. So um, let, me, let me. There's there's a couple of questions. Let me talk a little bit about how we onboarded the current because th these are a, a very important questions. You know, um, let me tell you how we onboarded uh, the group, what we're doing, and uh, kind of and how the MRSP scholars kind of fit into the overall public health measures within the NIH. First of all. This year, what we did is that um, we, we spaced out the uh, onboarding. Normally, uh, folks would all uh, arrive at one group. We did virtual onboarding, so administrative, administratively, folks became part of the program in July as we did virtual onboarding and actually began their uh, research and background reading and attending virtual lab meetings in the month of July. Um, and then, uh, then in August, people physically arrived to move into departments, and it was and so we spaced it out quite a bit, so we didn't have people uh, uh, congregating. One of the concerns at NIH leadership, obviously, is, and the clinical center, is that um, that you know, over half the patients that are seen at the NIH either are are uh, immunocompromised in one way or another, and so there are a lot of measures that we are putting into place to ensure, because the last thing to great fear, if, if we, you know, if we, uh, if that were to occur within the clinical center, how rapidly it could spread. So students all participate in an asymptomatic um, uh, screening program. So uh, all clinicians, in fact, I got approval for the MRSP scholars to participate in this program because they live on campus. Uh, most again, again, there's a lot of prohibitions on, on large space, uh, large gatherings, and, and that sort of thing. As far as the immunizations, we don't know that yet. We're still, you know, Dr. Collins was uh, addressed all of us in a virtual town hall meeting recently. We're not quite sure where we fit into that yet, so that's uh, that's still to be determined. So, okay, and we have two questions uh, regarding first year medical students. Uh, one question is, uh, what would you recommend? that a first year student start doing now in order to apply competitively in the future. And then we had a second question uh, asking uh, to confirm that actually first year students uh, were not uh, eligible, um, mm -hmm. if, if you could comment on that. Okay, good. Uh, you know, one thing I think West Virginia is, is has a, is, it, is it called a PRISM program? Is that right? Do intro. I have, okay, intro program, right, yes. okay. Yep. So uh, a lot of schools have these programs, I can't remember. So the intro program, which is the introduction to research uh, that occurs between uh, first and second year, I think taking advantage of that becomes very powerful, you know, uh, because first of all, it, you may find that you don't like bench research, for example, or something. You may find this isn't me, you know. And then they may say, that one that really lights my fire. So I think, you know, joining a, a program such as that um, 
can actually uh, inspire you and solidify your notion. So take advantage of opportunities like that. I think your, your force because West Virginia has a very robust program in that. Um, it's, it's hard to participate in research as a first uh, year medical student, but I would uh, advise you to speak to your know, advisor and Dr. Hodder to see, are there things that you could participate in uh, even at low intensity level? I think these are probably the most important things that, that uh, you can do as a first year medical student. Um, and that carries on in, into your second year as well. As far as uh, the, uh, the eligibility, that is correct. We, we take students, we want students to have completed at least uh, two years of medical school before they be, uh, begin the MSP scholarship program. And that's kind of a, a programmatic requirement. Okay, thank you. And then we have a question for Sundas. Uh, and the question is, did you have any complications when trying to incorporate this program into your medical school path? And do you think it gives you any certain advantages or disadvantages to uh, other students entering the third year uh, who did not do the program? Thank you for the question. I think um, the great thing about MRSP is you can decide whether you want to do it after your second year, as I did, or after your third year. So it has that flexibility built into it. Personally, I found it to be a breath of fresh air. It was, I believe, a week and a half after I took step one that I moved to Bethesda and it was just amazing to be able to put away first aid, even though for some bizarre reason I packed first aid with me and brought it um, and be able to focus on a full-time lab experience, meet new people. It felt like coming out of the dark library into something totally new and something very collaborative and a lot of fun. And so I don't think that academically it really puts you at any disadvantage. Coming back to third year, I've actually found that it has benefited me in a number of ways. Numerous attendings on my clerkships have commented that I'm able to put into my plans um, research that is cutting edge and I'm able to write notes that are consistent with new research and really dive into the literature in a mature way. And I've had multiple attendings make that comment to me. So I think it does give you a little bit of a training that you really don't get a chance to do in medical school because everything is so packed together with other core requirements. And in terms of catching up academically to your peers, I think it's a very quick turnaround time because the clerkship learning is so distinct from the learning in the first two years that um, you're, everyone's starting out fresh anyway as a third year. And so I really think that you really are not at a disadvantage if you go in between your second and your third year. And should you join between your third and your fourth year, you have the added benefit of having narrowed down a specialty that you're interested in and you can pursue research avenues in that specialty. Although personally, I found that basically any lab you join at the NIH and Dr. Mehta's is a great example, you'll find a collaboration. And in my lab that was collaborating between cardiologists, radiologists, dermatologists. So it touches on a number of different medical fields that will ultimately become relevant to the specialty you choose. And then as a last thought, at WVU, everyone is so friendly that I found that joining a new class wasn't a problem at all. Everyone welcomed me with open arms. If I can just add uh, additional comment on that is, uh, you know, Sunday's experience is, is what other MRSP scholars uh, discuss as well. So it's not just unique to Sunday's. It's that fact that, you know, uh, and it is a, a, a genuine concern that the students talk about, you know, am I going to get behind? Am I going to forget everything I've learned? But, you know, strong medical students, and we accept strong medical students, um, remain strong medical students. And so when you return it, you have, as, as Sandra pointed out, you have an additional experience that can be added to that. Uh, you know, certainly some of those clinical pearls you learned as a second and third year medical student may have like solidified a little bit, but they quickly come back, especially when you get into the rhythm of clinical medicine. So um, I, I think that most people afterwards say it wasn't that hard. It, and so uh, I, I think that that would not, should not be a dissuader for the, taking a year off to do research like this. And, and just to add to Dr. Burklow, the academic parts of MRSP, including the teaching rounds and also listening to your peers' presentations keeps you fresh on a number of different pathologies because you're right. going to hear about all kinds of different disease processes. Right. This is not, yeah, exactly. This is not like you know, taking gear off to do, you know, uh, chemical yeah. engineering. This is all about clinical medicine. So, yes. Dr. Burklow, would you like to comment uh, the pros and cons as you see them for students uh, uh, doing the scholars program after the second uh, year of medical school versus the third mm -hmm. year? That's a great question. Um, 
I think that you know, it depends on yourself. Uh, how's that for a wishy-washy answer? <laughs> I, I think from, from uh, there is a group of um, uh, investigators who actually like students after their second year because they're a little bit left differentiated, if you will, you know, as opposed to a person who's clearly set on doing retinal research and that sort of thing. So um, I, I think overall, it, there's not a, a particular advantage or disadvantage from a research perspective. I think that people probably tend to be a little bit more open-minded to the other opportunities after between the second and third year, rather than between third and fourth years. Because as, as Sundance points out, when people come back into medical school as a fourth year, you're, you're pretty, you've pretty much narrowed down what you want to be doing. And so this does give you an opportunity if you're, if you're not differentiated, you know, sorry, what I want to do, it's not a bad thing to do between the second and third year. Okay. And we have another question uh, from the audience. As a second year student, is it possible to apply? And if accepted, uh, would it be possible to defer? That's a good question. No, unfortunately, we don't offer deferments. And so you, you would apply to the year that you're interested in. So. Okay. All right. That is the last question I see. Uh, Ian, did I miss any questions? No, I think we hit. I think we hit everything that's in chat. Okay, I I just would like to to ask uh, Sundus and Dr. Berkler, would you just like to to you know make a final comment? Uh, maybe Sundus, do you want to go first? Sure. I I think that um, one of the great things about medical school and one of the most challenging things about medical school is being presented with an enormity of options and not being able to find your niche. And I think one of the great things about MRSP is that it is very, you do a lot of self-thinking and because you are interfacing with so many wonderful mentors, you begin to see yourself in others. And um, it's just very clarifying and very validating to have people around you who are so invested in mentoring. So I think regardless of if you do MRSP or not, finding a really solid mentor who you trust is one of the most important pieces of medical school. Thank you. And Dr. Berklow? Well, Sundas once again just took my line. So, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I hate her. Oh. No, uh, no, I'm just, I'm joking. You know, yeah, what she says is absolutely true. You know, whatever, well, whatever you do, whether or not it's research or, you know, if you, you, if you pursue a path as a clinician, developing mentors and uh, identifying mentors, and you could have more than one mentor. You know, that's another thing to just kind of point out. You may have a research mentor, a clinical mentor, uh, a life mentor. Identifying mentors is so important. And, and these individuals uh, can support you and provide you guidance uh, you know, for the rest of your, your career. And so MRSP, we're focused. And one thing things that you get here, you, you, you constantly hear the word uh, mentorship. And it really is a culture, uh, I think, that exists at the NIH. I think that the people can... Uh, that can participate in this, that uh, that benefit. So that I think it, this is a great this is a great program for specific individuals who have specific uh, paths. But you know, sometimes you don't know am I am I the right person. So what I would encourage you to do is to reach out to us if you're kind of undecided. You know, again, speak to your mentors at uh, West Virginia, to Dr. Hodder, uh, and reach out to myself and uh, Dr. Lightman. And we'll be happy to talk to you about the program, you know. Um, and you know, it it, it th and the other thing I wanted to point out: this is not your uh, only opportunity. It is a competitive program. If you're not selected, that doesn't that's not a judgment, you know. And there are uh, other uh, a lot of folks who go on to really develop a robust careers who weren't accepted in the MRSP program. Continue looking for opportunities and find that thing that you're really passionate about. And that's probably the thing that makes a, a, a person most successful as a researcher is finding those questions that you really are passionate about uh, answering. So, yeah. Before we wrap up, I, I just want to um, clarify with Ian, we'll make these slides available. And uh, I just want to uh, sort of say they'll be on the CTSI website. Is that correct, Ian? Yeah, we, we have the this recorded and we'll also have the slides available. Okay. All right. 
Uh, once again, I want to thank uh, Sundas and Dr. Burklow for a terrific presentation. Uh, I want to thank all of the students for attending. Uh, you know, this is, if there's anything that I can do or, uh, you know, provide information, and, and I think it's tremendously uh, generous that Dr. Burklow mm -hmm. offered, you know, to, uh, you know, his time, um, you could talk with him or Dr. Lightman, and I would really encourage you to do that if you're really having sort of any, you know, issues uh, about this or exactly if this is what you want to do. And of course, Sundas is a, having been through the experience, I think really, mm -hmm. you know, provides a perspective that, that the rest of us uh, can't. Right. Uh, I also I also want to thank uh, Ian Moore and Stephanie Ballard Conrad who really did the work to put this together. Uh, and uh, Dr. Burklow, did you want to offer something else? I was going to say thank you for uh, for having me. I really do appreciate it uh, to be able to talk to to meet everybody again and actually talk about the program. And um, again, I, I wish I was I was there. Uh, maybe next summer we'll try again. So. We'll take we'll you to a nice Morgantown restaurant. Yes, right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> when our restaurants oh. are open. Yes. Last time I know. Last time I, was there, I had great barbecue. I just love barbecue. So you know that sort of thing. So we'll <laughs> next to Korean fun. food, Sundays. I like yes. barbecue. Oh, so. Korean food in Bethesda. <laughs> Korean food in Bethesda is the reason to go. Well, that would be my last. There you word. go. Okay. Yes, but I know the best. Okay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, right. folks. Well, listen, thank you so much. Stay warm. Stay well. Let us know what we can do. Uh, don't hesitate to contact us. Thank you again. Right. Thank you again for having me. Bye-bye. You'll have a good evening. Bye. You too.